I hope you're all a bit awake because we're going to dive right into the technical <laughs> stuff. We're going to look at how XPC is implemented um, and really figure out how the Mac ports of it work. So I'm Thijs Alkemade. I'm a security researcher at CompuTest. It's a security company from the Netherlands where we do security services like pen testing, incident response, red teaming. Um, but at CompuTest, I'm part of the research team, which means that we don't work for customers, but we do security research with the goal of making the world a bit safer. That's really why we do this work. Um, other write-ups that uh, we have published uh, are here. Uh, last year, there was a talk about uh, process injection in macOS. So for me, macOS has really been kind of like my specialty when we have other research projects that we're stuck on and I feel like I want to do something else for a change and I really just start looking at how the internals of my own Mac work and that's basically how I find most of these vulnerabilities. So, what I'm going to talk about today is XPC. XPC is like an inter-process communication technique in macOS, but it's also used in all of Apple's other operating systems. And it's quite often used to separate privileges. So you may have like a low privileged client that communicates with a daemon and it asks it to perform certain operations that it can do that the client cannot do. So therefore, there's also quite often some kind of authorization check needed. So the server, the daemon needs to check, is this client really supposed to be able to do this? And that authorization check can be a lot of different things, but in Apple's own software, it's typically checking for a certain entitlement, or in third-party software, you often see a check for a specific team ID, um, like the, the team, Apple developer team. But there are other, can be other checks, like does it have a certain TCC permission, or is the client sandboxed? Uh, there's a lot of different possibilities. Now, it's, it's well known by now that there's a function XP connection get bit, but that's not safe to use for this. Um, this has been documented quite often. I'm not completely sure who discovered it first. I know Samuel Gross uh, did a presentation about this. There's uh, an issue about from Ian Beer about this in macOS. And there was also a presentation at OBTS 3, I think, from Wojciech Gula about this and that this function is not safe to use. So what is the, the issue with this function? Well, it's vulnerable to a race condition because you can send the message then execute another process that would be authorized to send that message, and then hope that the message rec is received um, in process after you executed that new process. So when it starts checking the authorization, it checks the other process instead. Now, on iOS, you cannot simply just exact some other process, but there are other tricks you can do with crushing your own app and making it reuse a bit. Um, so, yeah, this has been well established by now, and often the recommendation is to use XCC connection get audit token. Now, this is safer because the audit tokens are it's a structure that contains not just the PID, but also a PID version. And that PID version that's increased every time a new process executes. So it's not, no longer possible to get the PID to be reused, um, and therefore this is, it's clear what process you're investigating. But in this talk, I will show that there are still situations where this function gives you the wrong audit token, and therefore that you may do an incorrect authorization check. Um, and therefore it's better to use the function XPC dictionary get audit token if possible. So this is also part of the non-public API, uh, XPC connection get audit token as well. Um, so if you do this in third party code and you don't want to use any third in the private APIs, I'm not sure if you even can do that, so uh, ask Apple for that. So we're going to dive into the way XPC is implemented, um, and it's implemented on top of Mac messages. And uh, if you're familiar with NSXPC connection, that's implemented using libxpc. Now, Mac messages are open source. Uh, libxpc, we have the API, we know something about what it does, but the internals of it are not open source. So we don't really know how connection establishment or the, the packet format, that's all not been documented by Apple. Um, so in this talk, I will go over what I discovered by reverse engineering this and looking at other people who looked at this. Um, but I couldn't really find a lot of documentation or other people's reverse engineering work. So a lot of it is reverse engineered, which means that it might be like guesswork. Um, 
not really sure if everything is correct. And also it may change in every, any uh, update, like always with, with internals. So I'm gonna go do a very quick crash course in Mac messages, just to make sure that I've introduced all of the terminology. Many people are probably familiar with this, but I think I should go over it. So Mac messages are sent to Mac ports, and these are a single receiver, multiple sender communications channel, and it's managed by the kernel. So similar to a file descriptor or a socket, the actual object itself lives in the kernel, and processes can only indirectly use them through the APIs offered by the kernel. And it refers to it by a name, and that's like an, a, an integer that just uh, the kernel can translate. If this process uses this integer, then it must be this Mac port. And Mac ports are used all over the system for all sorts of APIs, not just XPC. But there's other kernel APIs, for example, that are built entirely on Mac messages. Now, there are th three types of writes that you can have for a Mac port. You can have a receive write, which means that you can receive the messages on uh, that port. Only one process can have it because it's single receiver. There's a send write, which means that you are one of the senders. And there's send once. It means you can send one message and then afterwards the kernel will invalidate that port. Now, Sing single direction messaging sounds very limited because how do you get a reply? Well, of course, there's a way to do that. Um, you can duplicate writes. So if you have a send write, you can duplicate it. Uh, receive, you cannot duplicate, of course, because there can only be one receiver. And you can transfer writes, which is how you can set up two-way communication. So if you have a Mac port, then it needs a header, and there's one field specifically for a reply port. So if you send a message, you include a reply port, and if the other service wants to reply, it can use that um, to send you a message, which means you're basically transferring a send once right to the other process, which can then send something back. Now, when I first started into looking into Mac messages, I thought everything was really confusing, so I'm gonna give some, some terminology help here. I, coming from more of a networking side, I thought the port name was really confusing, because if you use to TCP, then the port identifies one endpoint, but here the port is the communications channel. And holding a write, that's basically just, it is the sender or it is a receiver. It's just less awkward to talk about transferring writes than talking about transferring the receiverness of a port. Um, that's why those terminology is used. So that's basically the, the Mac port basics that I need to cover. So now for how do you establish an XPC connection? Well, there are multiple different types of XPC connections. You can have Mac services implemented in launch agents or launch daemons. You can have an XPC service embedded in your own application. And there are other ways with endpoints where you can transfer an endpoint of a uh, XPC connection over another XPC connection. But I'm going to focus here on establishing a connection to a Mac service. So like if it would be a launch agent or a launch daemon, then you would follow this. So this means that you have a name and you need to transform that into a service port. And that works by asking the bootstrap service, which is a part of launchd. You ask it, I'm looking for this specific service. And then the bootstrap service will check its own lookup table and it sees it has a send write. It will duplicate that, send it back to the client uh, once you initiate the connection. So you ask the bootstrap service and you get a service port back. Now, when you have a service port, um, the client will generate two new ports a server port and a client port. And then it sends a MAC message to initiate the connection. The idea of this is root. I'm not really sure if that's intended, but probably is intended, but I'm not sure why uh, they use this. And in this message, um, it transfers the receive write of the server port and the send write for the client port. So what that means is that the server will can then start listening on the server port for incoming messages from the client, from our application. And the server can use the, the send write for the client port to send messages back. Uh, if the server accepts the connection, they can also decide to just drop it and then they don't use any, do anything with it. Uh, so then they can both exchange messages. 
Uh, this was induced at reply port field that I showed earlier. Um, but there are functions within XPC to use this. There's XPC connection send message with reply, and also a sync version of that. And if you use NSXPC connection, then you can have callbacks that also use replies. So um, there's a really on the protocol level a difference between normal messages and replies. So I, I have wondered before, is it possible that you get a reply and a message at the same time and you might confuse them and how does it keep track of that? But by doing it this way, um, it's clear that that's not possible. So that's basically how you set up a connection. But where do those, all the tokens come from? Well, when you're using the MAC message system call to ask the kernel to get you a new message, you can give it a flag, MAC receive trailer all that, um, which means that the, the kernel will append the trailer to the message with the audit token of the sender. So you have first the MAC message header, then there's some payload, so an XPC message, and then the kernel just inserts a new audit token after it. And every time you receive an XPC message or a reply, there's a function XPC connection set creds, and all this function does, it, it copies the audit token from the message to the connection object every time a new message is received. So now about what did I find? So we saw three different things here. XPC connections use an authorization check that assumes that there is a one-to-one -one connection here, but MAC ports are multiple senders, single receiver. So there can be multiple senders on the connection. And then XPC connection get all the token returns to all the token of the most recently received message. Uh, so that led me to this question. Can I set up an XPC connection where there are multiple processes sending at the same time to the server? And if that happens, if you somehow construct an XPC connection like that, can we fake an audit token? Can we spoof it so that the system thinks that, well, one message was received, but the audit token that it uses is not the right process, not the process that actually sent that message? And I discovered that, yes, this is possible. Because the client generates both MAC ports for the connection, both the server port and the client port. It can specifically construct them and use them in a way that makes multiple senders on an XPC connection possible. However, spoofing the audit token is possible under only limited circumstances. So uh, I have two different variants of it where it's possible. Um, but in other cases, the audit token will be correct. And for explaining the first variant, I'm going to give an example first and then explain what the actual conditions are. And for this, uh, I'm going to look at the service management daemon, SMD. Now, if you write a Mac application and you have some component that needs to run as root, then there's a function that you can use. It's called smjobbless. And you can use this to install a new helper tool that will run as root. Um, and you need to first ask the user to enter their password. And there's, there's a, like a prompt for uh, once to install some, some helper. And if the user enters their, enters their password, you get an authorization reference. And then you can pass this into this API uh, to install that tool. And if you want to know more about this, it was covered uh, pretty thoroughly in Objectives by the C version 3 by Julia Fashenko in uh, Jobs, Blessers, Privileged Operations on macOS. Now, the goal of my exploit was to install a privileged helper tool without the user entering their password. So getting the SMD to think that it should install my helper tool without actually having passed an authorization reference. Now, this function smjobless, it needs to communicate with SMD to perform the actual installation because it needs to run as root to do this. So SMD runs as root, therefore it can do the installation. Now, SMD has multiple different actions. It can manage daemons, it can disable them. Uh, so there's a routine field in every message to indicate which option you want, to, want it to perform. And the uh, 1004 is the routine that's used by SMJobBless. And here you can see some part of the disassembled code here. 
Um, so what this does is it asynchronously performs a block. So this is constructing a block. And this is the function that will execute there. I've named it handle bless. Uh, it's reverse engineered code, so I just made up that name. And it executes this on a different dispatch queue. Now, for this operation, there is an authorization check. Um, but it, it is a bit unusual because there's three different options for when you may perform this installation. If the process is running as root, then it can install this privileged helper tool. I think this is a really interesting feature if you're a sandbox process running as root because you can escape the sandbox, but that's not for today. Um, or if you have an entitlement com.apple.private.xpc.authenticated blast, yeah, this is just a couple of Apple tools that have this. Or if you pass an authorization reference uh, for a specific uh, authorization name. Now, the third one is what happens if you call smjobless because you need to pass it that authorization reference you got by the user entering their password. But, but the goal of my exploit is to make it think that I am in the first category so that I am running as root while I'm not actually. Um, so it will accept the installation. Now, for this attack to work, I need not just a process that is vulnerable, but I need some, imp some per process I can impersonate, I can pretend to be. And for this, I picked the diagnostic D. Uh, there's probably a lot of other processes that work just as well. Um, this is a daemon that can monitor a process. You tell it, I want information about this process, and then it will start sending you messages about what the process is doing. And it runs as root, but the actual contents of the messages aren't really relevant here. Um, just the fact that it starts sending messages back is what I need. And then I construct an XPC connection like this, or basically two XPC connections. I first establish a connection to SMD, completely following the normal XPC protocol, nothing weird going on here. But then, when I establish a connection to Diagnostic D, <coughs> instead of giving it my client port for the replies, I give it another send write to the SMD server port. And because I created all of these ports, I can just duplicate them as much as I want and uh, pass them along. And what this means is that if I send a message to Diagnostic D, Diagnostic D receives it. But when Diagnostic D starts streaming messages about the information, they will actually end up at SMD. And from SMD's point of view, there's just one connection. So it receives messages, um, but it, it thinks there's just one person on the other end, but there's actually two processes talking to it. So to, to summarize that again, I establish a normal connection with SMD and another connection with Diagnostic D where messages Diagnostic D sends go into the connection to SMD. And then, once I have constructed this, I can start trying that 1004 message to get it to install a privileged helper tool. Now, if I'm lucky, then a message from Diagnostic D comes in, and because this, uh, messages, those 1004 messages are handled asynchronously, so that dispatch async, it might happen that this 1004 comes in, but before it actually starts executing the other code on the other queue, a message from Diagnostic D comes in, and that overrides the audit token. And then when it checks the, 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 uh, yeah, the process ID of the, or the user ID of that other process, and it will see, hey, this is a process that's running as root, so I must continue with the installation because it's allowed to do this. So this worked. It is a race condition, um, but we can retry really quickly because, yeah, we can just keep sending messages. If it doesn't work, nothing really bad happens. And also, SMD doesn't recognize those messages sent by Diagnostic D because there's no routine field in it, but it doesn't really care. It just drops the message and moves on. It keeps the connection open, and it, it can just keep going on uh, retrying. And typically, within just a few seconds, it would install that privileged helper tool. And once it's installed, we have essentially elevated privileges. And there were a few cases where it would crash. 
Um, not really sure what was going on there. The kernel was logging something about SMD having too many Mac ports allocated. Uh, it's probably something I was doing wrong in my exploit of manually, manually managing those uh, Mac ports because, yeah, I wasn't really <laughs> knowing what I was doing. So that's probably something that can be fixed. But most of the time, this worked uh, quite reliably. Now, as you've seen yesterday in the presentation from Patrick, um, there is now a notification if you install a new privileged helper tool. Um, but yeah, they're, they're quite common. So uh, at the, point, the time you see that notification, the payload is already executed. Uh, my code is already running as root. So the user might be able to respond to it, or maybe I can borrow some tricks for uh, avoiding that notification. Um, but yeah, at that point, my code is already running. Now, something interesting about this is that it also works if you enable the sandbox. Um, but it is kind of limited as a sandbox escape because you need to specifically construct your application. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'll refer to the, the write up we'll publish later if you want to know more about that. So, this is the first variant I found where you can spoof an audit token. Now, to summarize what is required here, I need to have two different Mac services. <coughs> one that I want to exploit, which has an authorization check, and one that I use to impersonate. Um, and I need to be able to connect to both. Uh, yeah, if, if the sandbox does not allow me to connect to those services, then I cannot use them for this attack. And also, if they reject me immediately upon establishing the connection, it also doesn't work. The service that I want to exploit, it must have this authorization check. Um, yeah, obviously, uh, the other process must be able to pass that authorization check. <coughs> and the impersonated service, I must be able to get it to start sending messages Preferably a lot of them, because it might be a race condition, but it needs to be normal messages, not replies. And the important part here is that that authorization check must be performed asynchronously from the actual receiving a message. And the reason that's necessary is because normal XPC messages, so the event handler for them, it, they will not be executed concurrently. Even if you use an uh, concurrent dispatch queue, the event handlers for one message must be finished before the event handler for a new message uh, can be executed. Now I have a second variant, which is by forwarding the reply port. <coughs> and how this works is that uh, while those event handlers cannot execute concurrently, receiving a reply can happen concurrently with receiving a normal message. So if a reply comes in and a normal message at around the same time, then it may happen that the normal message gets checked with the, authorization, with the audit token of the reply instead of the normal audit token. Uh, but th this requires me to uh, have a service that sends a message to me, which expects a reply, and then I can take that reply port, forward it somewhere else, and then if a message comes in on the reply port, it will override the audit token. So I have an image of this one as well. So suppose this exploited daemon sends a message with a reply port to my app, and I don't reply to it, but instead I send another message to the impersonated daemon, and I copy the reply port, and then I hope that the following happens almost concurrently, so I have a message to the exploited demon and another reply and a reply from the impersonated demon, and I hope that the audit token of this one overrides the one for that one. I spent a lot of time looking for some place where I could apply this, but I couldn't really find any demons that match all of the requirements. But I did manage to reproduce it with uh, two Mac services I implemented myself. So you have a, you have a log for this. Um, where I just compare the audit token of the connection if it's still the same. Now to summarize uh, the requirements here, um, 
if you check the audit token before accepting a connection, so if you're in the function listener should accept new connection, then that's not vulnerable because at that point there's no connection established yet. And also XPC event handlers are never called concurrently, so you need either to call the function XPC connection get audit token asynchronously, so uh, not directly from the event handler, or you need to receive a reply um, concurrently with a normal message uh, to trigger it to use the wrong audit token. So, I had one instance of it. I wanted to report it to Apple, but if you think something is a structural issue and you only have one example, then that's not a very convincing argument that you can make. Because then it's just, yeah, that, that one team made a mistake there, we're going to fix this one and ignore the larger issue. So usually when we have something and we, we say it's structural, it's good to have like at least three examples or something where you can, can point to the same issue. And I also thought it would be nice to have something on iOS as well, to show that it affects not just macOS, but also instances uh, uh, exist on iOS. But yeah, I spent quite a few days trying to find if this issue occurs somewhere else. Um, and preferably on iOS, because I already had impact on macOS. So I tried a few different things to look for this. So one thing was to use Frida to hook on the function uh, XPC connection get audit token. And one thing you can do with Frida is you can look at the backtrace. And I would look at the backtrace to see, is this being called from an XPC event handler? And if not, I would print it out and I would see, oh, there might be an incorrect check here. Um, but this is, of course, dynamic analysis, which means that I'm only checking functionality that's currently being used, so I'm not really uh, exploring every possible call. And also, I'm only looking at one daemon at a time. I cannot attach Frida to every daemon on iOS that's going to crash the phone. Um, so, yeah, it did result in some interesting findings, but those all turned out to be, yeah, not really having security impact. And I was able to do this with a security research iPhone, so I could use the latest iOS and still run Frida on it. Um, Signups are still open for the next generation, so if you're interested in doing research like this, uh, yeah, go to Apple's security website and you can find more about that. Also, something I tried is to decompile a lot of iOS Mac services to see how they use those audit tokens and the XPC connections. Uh, I did discover some other issues while doing that, uh, not really related to this vulnerability, um, but not any instances that I could find for this. I tried to write a guide script to analyze calls for XPC connection, get set event handler, and then it gets a block, and I need to analyze the block to find dispatch async, and then I need, yeah, but this was getting really messy because block syntax in uh, decompilers just becomes really annoying to, to transfer. And then you also have the, the shared cache that makes it really impossible to, to search through everything. So at some point I just decided, yeah, I'm going to submit what we have, I'm going to report it as a structural issue, uh, but also point to this specific instance in SMD where I can exploit it. And I suggested the fix um, as dropping a message if the audit token no longer matches the audit token of the connection, or maybe Maybe you can allow changes to the UID, because there's set UID where you can change the UID of a process. But the PID or the PID version fields really should never change on an established XPC connection. You're not supposed to hand those over to another process. But yeah, as I feared, Apple only fixed the one instance of it in uh, SMD. And they did this by replacing the call to XPC connection get audit token with XPC dictionary get audit token. And this one, what it does, it, it copies the audit token from the received Mac message uh, instead of the, the connection object, uh, which means it's yeah, not vulnerable to this attack. But yeah, as I said, it may still affect other services. So if you want to have a look, if you think you're, yeah, want to spend some time on this, I really did not go through everything because it was just, too many conditions to look for, but if you think there might be something, then yeah, I highly recommend uh, looking into this. 
Now, if you write an XPC service yourself, for example, in uh, third-party software, then here's some hardening advice. So, if you receive a message and you don't recognize it, if you always expect messages with a routine field and it's not there, then maybe you want to drop the connection uh, because there's then clearly something weird going on, you're, you're receiving something you don't know. And the authorization check before accepting the connection, that's safe. Uh, so if you check it in like listener should accept connection, that's a safe check. If you check per operation, then you get into this risk where you use the wrong audit token. Or one thing you can do is if you're accepting the connection, you can get the audit token at that point and just save it yourself so that any time you want to check it, you grab the saved audit token instead of the uh, current XPC connection audit token. And also there are some APIs to automatically perform a code signing check. So many third party developers now implement this themselves, but there are ways in the API to do this uh, if you want to just verify if an incoming connection uh, should be authorized. Now, to summarize, uh, XPC is a one-to-one -one communication channel, or it's assumed to be a one-to-one -one communication channel, but it's built on top of MAC messages, which are multiple sender, single receiver. Um, so this abstraction might go wrong, where you can create an XPC connection where there are multiple processes sending messages at the same time. And one, once that happens, the audit token of that connection becomes unreliable. I've shown how I've exploited this to elevate privileges to root on macOS, but I think there might be a lot more instances of this existing somewhere else. I only spend a little time looking at iOS, but yeah, macOS services, uh, there's a few more than of those that are, don't that exist on iOS, so uh, the issue might still apply somewhere else. And this was not addressed structurally, so yeah, if you want to have a look, go ahead. If you want to read this back, um, there will be a write-up of this. It's not yet online. I need to make some last-minute changes, but I hope to do this later today. And this is a link to our website or QR code, uh, if you trust that. Uh, I think I still have a little bit more time, so I have some bonus slides. Um, so this exploit still works. If I clicked the sandbox my application button in Xcode, which I thought was quite interesting, However, as a sandbox escape, it's not really an issue um, because I need to embed the privileged helper tool that I want to install within my application. I need to set an info.plist key about the privileged helper tool, otherwise the installation is not allowed. So that needs to be relative to the application. So I cannot exploit just some random application because those won't have those uh, files within them. I could try submitting this to the Mac App Store but these are very simple static checks that there's some launch uh, agent within the application. So I think App Review will reject this very quickly, um, but I'm trying to stay away from security testing App Review because that doesn't go over very well, I think. So basically the only impact you could really have is if a user downloads an app, you could convince them just, yeah, just launch it because look, it has the sandbox entitlement, so it's safe, just, just run it. But there's also already a lot of ways you can do this with just an unsandboxed XPC service. Uh, so it worked from the sandbox, but it's not really a sandbox escape. But it also showed some more general issue. Namely, DiagnosticD would normally not be allowed to talk to SMD. But because I set up the connection, it was able to do this communication. So the reason that works is because the sandbox prevents looking up the service port for a specific name. It doesn't prevent the actual connection establishment. So suppose you have unsandbox code execution as a normal user, sandbox code execution as root in some kind of sandbox, but you can pass Mac ports between those two then there is some attacks that you could do by opening the connection from the uh, unsandbox normal user process, passing the connection to the other uh, root process, and then there's an, a lot of attack servers that might be available. So in SMD, th this routine doesn't work due to the embedding, but there might be other functions uh, in there that you can call uh, because 
it looks now that there's a connection from root, but instead it's really just yeah, you setting up that connection. So that's just uh, how the sandbox affects this. Now, yeah, again, if this is the website where the, the write-up will be, and if there's any questions, then uh, be happy to hear them. Brief question, this is maybe not a super technical one, but you find some really interesting bugs. Uh, I really like the ones when they're, they're structural, that shows kind of a, a very deep problem. Can you briefly just describe like how you decide what to focus on? Like, okay, I'm gonna see if audit tokens are racy or um, nib files are perhaps like an injection mechanism. Uh, just some thoughts on that. So typically this works by just, I'm reading some write-up by somebody else and then I find something, and then I think, oh, if I link this with the other information I already have, then there might be an issue here. So in this case, I was reading a write-up, I think from Scott Knight, about how XPC connections work, and I saw that he also mentioned that the audit tokens are copied every time a message is received. And that sort of got me thinking about this, and it took a long time to get from just this idea of this might be something I can try to actually have it done and finished and working. Um, so, yeah, I, ju I just read a lot of, of things, how they work, I disassemble a lot, and then at some point you start linking things together and realizing that there might be mismatches. Any other questions? All right, well thank you again, that was an incredible talk.